Good morning, everyone. Start with a little bit of apology, because it's always really bad for a speaker. The apology is that I don't actually intend to present what I originally planned over the last sort of few weeks. And that's really been based on a lot of the commentary and the nature of the audience and interest. So, over dinner last night with my family, I mean, they, they could see I was agitated in terms of what I was going to change it to to try to make it relevant and interesting for yourself. And my youngest son turned to me and said, Dad, how difficult can it be? You know, you've spent 25 years presenting as a sort of professional businessman. Um, you used to be a professional musician, having to get up on stage and actually perform night after night in terms of gigs. And I turned around to him. He's, he's 11. Again, another connection with 11. I said, son, they're all teachers. <laughs> and in that way that 11-year-olds, like little rite of passage into wisdom, he said, ah. Okay. And we just had really fun dinner after that. But let me, um, on a sort of serious note, my personal experience of schooling actually was pretty bad. I had a lot of very uninspired um, sort of natures in terms of what was being taught. I could see a system being stressed. This was 28 years ago. People were going through the rope books. It was all about passing exams. There was very, very little in terms of engagement and excitement around it. And what I found, actually, was what I needed to do was find alternative technologies to make it exciting. You know, some of those alternative technologies were television. The, the Royal Institute Christmas Lectures you know, was hugely inspiring to me, again, as a sort of young boy, in terms of, again, to, to be exposed to a whole new world. And then computers. I mean, a number of people have sort of mentioned uh, the ZX80, the course, and the BBC computer. My first computer was an MK14. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but if Sinclair put it out ahead of the ZX80, you had to build it yourself. You know, and age 10, I remember the excitement of building this thing that after I'd finished building it, it did absolutely nothing. You, know, <laughs> you had to program it in hexadecimal code. But that was hugely exciting. That was a sandbox environment. That was, that was the sort of the, the whole iPad, iPhone generation in terms of just being exposed to doing something new. So what have I done? Well, for most of the 25 years, I've worked in, in environments and industries being told that things could not happen, that things could not be changed, things could not be built. Um, and generally, you know, a lot of these things were sort of big scale problems, whether it was with banks, governments, regulators. Uh, I've worked with countries in terms of designing new economies. Um, and every, on every single occasion, I've worked in environments where often my own fellow partners said it couldn't be done. And what I've done is I've built about 15 teams over the last 25 years. Some of those are separate companies. Um, John alluded to some of those in terms of in the traditional big four consulting environments. Some have been in, in other environments. Uh, collectively, I mean, all those teams still exist. Many of them won, have won uh, awards. They account for probably about $2.4 billion per annum of revenue. Now, these, these are not human-scale problems, but they are absolutely solved by humans who've changed things and done things differently. That very much is the nature of what I find to be so sort of hugely excited about the nature of these sorts of programs and the interface between the academia and the industry and the business elements. You know, I am... I have a PhD in mathematics. I've done a whole series of uh, elements. Of course, yes. I don't think of myself as a mathematician. Um, I do think of myself, though, as somebody who solves applied problems. And some of the things which, again, I've sort of seen more recently, and Neural Insights isn't a company that you would have um, heard of. Uh, it was only created in July of this year. Um, its focus is really on trying to build uh, some new innovation. The whole focus of Neural Insights is it's about growth. You know, we are looking at helping people understand what to do about creating the new new. You know, how do we help regulators, again, to sort of focus and align uh, what they're asking people to do? How do we help businesses increase and improve their confidence? I I've worked with the boards of most of the banks um, sort of globally. I mean, up until very recently, my travel schedule was five countries a week. So I was evenly spread across the US, America, you know, sort of Middle East, India, and, and uh, Asia Pacific. And I saw the same problems in every single country. People had this sense of inertia. And I think one person mentioned yesterday in terms of the nature of the meltdown, but one of the challenges in terms of the meltdown is that a lot of organizations are really scared and, and frustrated and uncertain about what to do next. One of the people who really sort of inspired me over the years has been, been sort of Feynman. And I thought this was quite an interesting quote uh, with some of the sort of discussions that were coming through yesterday around this whole mechanics of maths um, versus the, the, the analytical parts of the sort of problem um, sort of solving. And actually, one thing I also noted was the analog yesterday uh, that I think Marcus mentioned around, you've got to learn the scales and arpeggios, and then, then there's this vision of uh, actually then going in and doing some interesting pieces. Uh, let me, let me uh, let you into a little secret. World-class musicians do not learn music the way that most people in the world learn music. Scales and arpeggios are done when they are technically at their best. So people like Yudi Menuhin, he would practice for four or five hours before he even went near a scale. You know, they do things differently. You look at the architecture, you look at the emotional elements, you look at basically the whole balance of what it is you're trying to achieve, and then you, then you add some technique. 
associated with it. So, so that, again, for me, is, is a big part of this, this, this exercise and debate. And one of the challenges that I've got is that I'm essentially sort of here interested in making what you do relevant for the individuals that, that, that you sort of touch for the rest of their lives. And that's one of the challenges I've certainly had, again, globally, in that when I sort of go and hire people, uh, and it doesn't matter whether they've got First Class Oxbridge or Wharton or anything else, the, what the biggest challenge I often have is not the fact that they're, they're hugely motivated or they're clearly very intelligent. It's actually part of the application. It's the analytical core that, that, that often is the problem. I, I have, um, I, think, I, mean, I guess it's a blessed job in that I work in consulting, um, and my belief is that if you get it right, it could be the best university in the world. But so many people don't get it right, and they stop learning. They stop continuing that sort of process. So for me, there's a final element covered. And this was, I guess there was a little quote on the top there, which was uh, an extract of, of a, a TV program I did a few years ago, which was, uh, which actually called The Magic in the Brain. It was all about helping people really learn and, and understand about the thinking process, the analytical process and elements. And I guess the quote that sort of jumped out uh, to me, uh, yes, it was the whole, that whole nature of education as the soul of a, of a society. And clearly, with this room, there's, there's no point in terms of be focusing on terms of that top right. The fact that you're here clearly demonstrates that whole commitment and recognition of the world class elements. But then there's the other piece of the distraction, which is clearly, the, and, the, and the, deliberately the true education box is there, because the top left one is about the economics of education. And I think, again, I, I would like to see that explored much more. Uh, and I'm sort of, again, a hugely frustrated end user as a parent, often in terms of the quality uh, of what you get for your money around education. But equally, there were some of the comments that were coming around around the open source element that, again, I, I sort of feel as if we would not be doing education justice if we, if we focus on that. But the final comments I'd cover, which is really bringing the other three branches of this together, is that the nature of what you do in terms of maths and relevance in the industry part is actually quite a simple problem. And when I work with businesses, and it's, and it's about the, the equation element, again, often the technique is, is pretty straightforward. And John's y equals equation elements, actually in my world, becomes y equals as well. But the y is, why are you doing it? Why is it important? What value? And often what I always find is, if you keep asking that question, you then start to refine uh, the exercise. And I've, and I've worked with a, a number of sort of parties, again, or, who started out with maths problems or internet academic problems, that eventually then became businesses. And that's huge excitement when you see that transformation of what they do, because that then becomes a multiplier in, in, in many, many ways. And whether it's working directly with universities, helping them to, 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 to uh, sort of commercialize their events, to deal with sort of funding gap, or whether, again, it's, it's to do with just helping part of that, that business uh, origination. So that's all I wanted to uh, cover. <laughs>